I welcome you all to the 12th lecture of this NPTEL MOOC course entitled Psychology of Stress, Health and Wellbeing. So, this is the third lecture of module 4 and overall it is 12th lecture. So, before we talk about today's lecture, uh, let us have a brief recap of the last lecture that is lecture 11. So, in the last lecture, uh, we talked about a particular category of our coping strategy, uh, which is called as defensive coping or defense mechanisms. So, in the last few lectures, we were trying to understand what is the meaning of coping strategy and why it is so important to understand coping strategies. And then we started talking about some of the common maladaptive coping strategies that people commonly use in their life. And uh, in that context, we are discussing various strategies such as avoidance, self-indulgence, etcetera. And in the last lecture, we are talking about defensive coping, which is also a coping strategy, which can be maladaptive and also some uh, part of it, uh, aspects of it can be adaptive also. So, in the defensive coping, basically these are unconscious ways of uh, uh, dealing with uh, the overwhelming emotions and anxiety which is caused by uh, certain stimulus in our environment. Uh, so, there is an inner mechanism in human mind which unconsciously, you know, uh, uh, tries to deal with those anxieties and emotions. And, uh, which are basically in, in order to protect ourselves from the overwhelming emotions and they are called as defensive coping. Uh, and this was generally you know uh, first discussed by Sigmund Freud in his theory of psychoanalysis, where, he, where it you know talked about that there are uh, you know unconscious ways of you know uh, coping or coping with or adjusting with uh, the various you know overwhelming emotions such as anxiety. So, in order to understand defensive coping, uh, uh, we also discussed in the last class some of the basic ideas of say, Freud's theory and in that context, we have discussed you know uh, uh, the, the concept of human mind uh, as proposed by Sigmund Freud and we basically discussed uh, there are three aspects of human mind or labels of human mind. Uh, one is conscious mind, subconscious mind and unconscious mind and this categorization was done primarily based on the levels of awareness that we have about the content of those part of mind. So, in the conscious mind, the contents are generally conscious and we are aware about all the contents. Subconscious mind, the contents are somewhat you know half conscious, half unconscious. Uh, in the unconscious part as the name suggests, uh, we are not aware of those contents. So, these are fully you know unconscious aspects of our mind. So, so, this is one of the uh, fundamental ideas of fraud theory that we have discussed and we have also discussed the concept of structure of personality as proposed by Sigmund Freud. And in that context, we have discussed there are three important structure or component of human personality uh, which shapes human personality. One is called as id, 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 ego and super ego. So, id is we have discussed is basically you know that part of our personality which is primarily governed by you know pleasure principle. So, it only wants to gratify pleasure and it is very illogical, irrational and primitive part of our personality. And mostly at birth a baby is primarily id. So, it, it only works based on the principle of pleasure. So, it wants to gain pleasure, avoid pain. Then ego is uh, that part of personality that develops at the age of around 3 three or so uh, where no from id ego develops where no it is primarily you know functions based on reality principle. So, it starts to distinguish between uh, what is one's own inner desire and how to express it in a socially acceptable way you know based on the reality outside. So, it is more rational part of our personality and then uh, the Freud talked about super ego which develops somewhere at the age of 5. Uh, which is the moral aspect of our personality. So, it, it, it is basically developed based on the ideas given by parents, by the society, you know, uh, by the teachers about what is right, what is wrong, what is moral, what is immoral. 
etc. So, there is a kind of constant battle and interaction between these three parts and based on how much energy dis is distributed in all these three parts determines our personality. So, these and uh, many other things we have discussed in the last class. Uh, and we have discussed uh, typically that ego is that part which tries to balance the demands from id and super ego and in the process of balancing that sometimes ego resorts to defense mechanisms where it distorts reality little bit so that you know uh, the situations which are very overwhelming looks less overwhelming so that we are able to deal with them. So, examples of def we have discussed many examples of defense mechanism. Uh, such as denial, you know, sometimes you simply deny an aspect of reality which is very disturbing to you. So, let us say a chain smoker simply denies that smoking causes cancer or something. So, it, it protects his anxiety because accepting that will increase anxiety. Uh, so, similarly, we have discussed many other you know, defense mechanisms such as displacement, rationalization, intellectualization, uh, sublimation, uh, etcetera, etcetera. And uh, we have also discussed that defense mechanism can vary in their adaptive function. Some defense mechanisms are more adaptive as compared to others, uh, such as sublimation seems to be or at least as proposed by fraud is more healthier as compared to other. So, and excessive use of defense mechanism can be detrimental to our mental health. So, some, uh, some level of use of defense mechanism is okay, uh, but excessive use can lead to uh, some negative consequences. So, these are some of the important concepts that we have discussed in the last class. Uh, today, uh, we'll, uh, in the today's lecture that is lecture 12, we will discuss start talking about constructive coping or adaptive coping. So, this is more important because you know uh, many times because of the use of maladaptive coping, uh, we are not able to deal with the situation properly and in the long term we are facing negative consequences. So, so, we will try to understand and learn what are constructive coping and how can we use them in our day to day life uh, more so that you know, you know we are able to manage stress in a much more better ways. So, we will discuss constructive coping, coping effectiveness training some of the ideas around it and we will discuss start talking about some specific strategies of coping and today's lecture we will talk about physical ways of coping. So, what are constructive coping? So, when we talk about constructive coping as the name suggests, you know it involves uh, dealing with stress in a relatively healthy and positive way. So, that so the idea is uh, you are addressing the situation or stressful circumstances in much more constructive and healthy ways. So, that you know it it is not really causing problem in the long run. So, you are not dealing with it just in in terms of short term consequences, but you know, it has you know, uh, adaptive functions in the long run also and it is generally considered more positive. So, we are not born with the capability of for coping. So, we do at birth we do not know how to cope. So, slowly slowly we learn coping strategies and most of us are not actually exposed to stress management techniques. So, we kind of by trial and error from observing others somehow we learn few things in our life how to deal with difficult circumstances, but uh, nobody is really properly educated in that direction. Consequently, uh, we struggle in our life uh, while dealing with difficulties you know uh, of our life primarily because you know uh, many times we do not know how to deal with you know. Uh, stressful circumstances either in terms of problem focus or in terms of emotion focused. So, stress create tension or pressure in our mind which is neither good or bad you know stress itself is neither good or bad you know it is a kind of reality that we all all are exposed on a daily basis. So, it itself is neither good nor bad. But, you know our quality of life it depends on how we manage it. So, if you are not able to manage it or mismanage it, it can lead to many negative consequences, some of which we have already discussed in the last few lectures in terms of you know adverse physical health, mental health etcetera. And if we can properly manage it, we can actually grow out of it also. 
So, therefore, it is essential that we learn and develop coping skills that are constructive and healthy for the management of stress. So, it is very important that we kind of learn about it, so that we can use them in our uh, in, in our day to day functioning. So, at least you know psycho uh, the uh, no, literature of psychology provides us many insights in this in this direction. So, basically in this course or some of the lectures we will try to understand you know what are the insights provided by uh, literature in psychology. Uh, so, based on that we will derive some ideas and uh, you know practical applications of those ideas. So, effective coping skills reduces stress and lead to positive healthy outcomes as I have said. You know, it at least addresses the issue in a much more proper way and it reduces stress and has lead to positive healthy outcomes. So, there may be many characteristics of constructive coping uh, strategies. So, we will see one uh, 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 researcher whose name is Kaplan in 1964 provided seven characteristics of effective coping skills. So, he kind of disc, you know uh, in, in one, of his, one of his books in terms of crisis management, how can we effectively cope with uh, you know, stressful circumstances or difficulties or crisis of life. Although it is quite you know 1964 he talked about it, but still some of his ideas are very insightful and we can learn from them. So, let us see what are the seven characteristics he discussed. So, the first characteristics of effective coping skill uh, as discussed by Kaplan is actively exploring reality and being willing to seek out information. So, this is the first important characteristics for effective coping in a situation. So, one thing is actively exploring reality. So, active engagement uh, with the problem is very important. You know. Uh, as we have already discussed in some of the examples of maladaptive coping that people try to avoid and avoidance is not uh, re not adaptive in long run. In short term it may give you relief, but in long term it is actually uh, not very effective. So, effective coping includes actively involvement and seeking out realistic information from the situation. Okay. So, judgment or assessing or appraising the situation in a realistic way is very important because uh, many time our stress, our fears and anxieties are based on uh, some irrational or unrealistic assessment of the situation. So, something bad happens and simply people con conclude it as you know the, my, my life is doomed, which may not be true one aspect or one particular you know. A door of your life may be closed, but you may if you explore properly you will find many other doors where you can kind of you know uh, find out options and you know, come out of it. Uh, but simply because we exaggerate things so much we realist we do not realistically uh, you know, appraise the situation, uh, we sometimes you know exaggerate things and we uh, experience stress in a much more higher you know frequency and more intense ways. So, assessment exploring reality is very important uh, by seeking out uh, information, proper information, realistic information of a situation is one of the important characteristics of effective coping. Not just you know making up things in your mind which are irrational and unrealistic, it will only exaggerate your stress, but you know properly factual information of the situation what is there, what I have, what I can do about it, what are the options I have, what are the resources I have to deal with the situation. So, all this information we need to analyze, uh, it will it will help us to come out of the situation in a much more effective and adaptive ways. The second characteristics what Kaplan said uh, is that you know of effective coping is frustration tolerance and a willingness to express both positive and negative feelings freely. So, especially in the initial as uh, uh, initial uh, level of dealing with a stressful circumstances, you know, uh, dealing with the frustration is very important and you know one aspect is you know expressing of the emotion you know rather than bottling up. So, when we say expression of emotion it does not mean that you you get angry and you know start pouring your anger on someone else. Expression of anger means if you feel whatever positive or negative situ uh, emotions in a situation, primarily maybe negative emotions, you know, you express it. If you feel uh, you know, uh, 
in a safer way rather than on somebody else which will complicate the situation. So, because if you bottle up those feelings, obviously most of the psychoanalysis theories also talks about it. It actually complicates the uh, uh, emotions and regulation of emotion becomes much more difficult. Uh, so, at the especially the initial phase, expression of emotion um, is very important and it helps you to you know decrease or calm you down and decrease the frustration level also. And then you can kind of look at other proper you know ways to deal with the situation. So, this is another characteristics what is uh, discussed by him. The third characteristics uh, was is uh, basically uh, is actively seeking out help from others. So, throughout the research in the literature of you know stress and coping, one thing has been consistently discovered by researcher is that you know seeking help or social support, seeking social support is very important and significant coping strategy. Uh, because you know at the time of difficulty if you know someone can help you know lot of your stress automatically vanishes simply because you know there is someone who can help me out in the situation. And social support kinds of buffers against stress because you know you have resources. You yourself may not have that resources, but you know another person can give me that resource. So, it, it is an important protective factors and uh, it can give resources for both problem focused as well as emotion focused coping. So, it is very important and uh, it is you know uh, one needs to seek help whenever it is required. So, during the time of crisis you know if there are support available you, one should seek support. So, it is one of the best ways of kind of actively you know resolving the situations and coping with the situation. The fourth characteristics uh, discussed by Kaplan is breaking problems into manageable parts and working through them. So, one of the important characteristics is you know of a effective coping is that you know many times we sometimes are exposed to big problems uh, which are difficult to manage. So, breaking those bigger problems into smaller chunks and then deal with smaller chunks one by one is one of the best strategy to kind of solve the problems or deal effectively with the problems or crisis. So, we will uh, look little bit more also you know in the, ne in the next concept that we will be discussing here. So, because it is very difficult to deal with big problems, the bigger problems you know. So, some traumatic event happens in your life you know and for sometimes it is very difficult. So, for example, you know there may be some um, economic crisis in your life you know. So, directly you cannot deal with every aspects of economic crisis, but you can break it into chunks and find out at present what is the most important thing that you need to deal with. Maybe paying rent is most important now. You cannot deal with every aspect, but paying rent you can deal with because it is little it is much more smaller. So, breaking uh, big problems into smaller chunks and dealing one by one uh, is one of the best strategy and it is more then problem become much more manageable. So, this is one of the imp another important characteristics of effective coping. The fifth characteristic is being aware of fatigue and pacing coping efforts while maintaining control in as many areas of functioning as possible. So, one thing is obviously while dealing with stressful circumstances or crisis in life, one may become exhausted and you know fatigue can come uh, you know one, one may experience exhaustion and fatigue which is natural because you know it is not easy to deal with difficulties in of life. Whatever strategies that you use it may take your energy and resources and may lead to the experience of exhaustion and fatigue. So, one should understand what is your limitations and what are the options available to you and whenever fatigue and exhaustion comes it is also important to take care of oneself. Uh, in terms of using many other relaxation techniques and other things or seeking support etcetera. So, that you take care of yourself when exhaustion and things comes up. So, that you can deal with you know future problems much more effectively. So, this is one important part of it. So, you pace your coping strategies in such a way that you know. So, that exhaustion does not take, take total control over you and you can maintain control as much as possible to 
different functioning as possible. The sixth characteristics as described uh, is mastering feelings where possible, being flexible and possessing a willingness to change. Uh, so, so, mastering feelings are also very important. So, management of emotions is something you know in, is an integral part of coping strategy. Uh, so, initially we have discussed sometimes expression of emotion can be helpful especially at the initial phase when a lot of you know emotions are overwhelming. So, sometimes expression makes you lighter and calms you down. Uh, but we need to also learn to manage uh, destructive emotions particularly. You know how can we reduce them and manage them in such a way that you know you know uh, it has better impact on the outcomes of different activities that we do so one important is that you need to accept that whatever feelings in whatever ways you exp experience them uh, it is okay everybody experiences those emotions so accepting is first important things once you accept then you learn ways to deal with them so there could be many specific uh, strategies uh, which we will be discussing in the upcoming lectures so, that can be used to uh, master and manage and regulate emotions. And one need to be flexible in approach, you know, one should not be rigid in one particular ways of dealing with it, whatever works one need to look at and use them. So, that uh, psychological flexibility is very important and inner motivation to you know master oneself is also very important. Uh, without inner motivation, uh, we cannot really make any changes in our life. So, the last characteristics is having trust in oneself and others and maintaining an optimistic or maintaining optimism on outcomes. So, trusting oneself and others is also very important because you know, uh, if you do not trust or have faith in your capability, you will not try to do anything. So, we have discussed the concept of learned helplessness in the past lecture, past lectures, where you know we discussed that sometimes people become passive and withdrawn simply because you know they were exposed to some uncontrollable negative situations in their past and then in future they do not even try to change the situations. So, such approach may not help us. So, having faith that you can uh, you know still make changes in your life, having trust in yourself and seeking support from others who are around us is also very important. And obviously, one needs to be optimistic that you know uh, the future outcomes will be better and you can make changes in the outcomes and bring about positive changes. So, this is very important. So, by having trust in your ability to deal with your, with your situation and having faith in others who are supporting you, it is easier to deal with the demands of life. So, then it becomes very easy. You have faith and trust in what, what capabilities you have and you also have supportive others you trust to whom you trust basically and then I you know you have lot of resources to deal with situations. So, any situation can be dealt with. So, it is also important to maintain an optimistic outlook on outcomes to succeed in coming out of crisis. So, without optimism and hope, uh, we will not be motivated to do anything in life. So, this is very important psychological characteristics. So, these are some of se seven characteristics that was uh, you know, discussed by Kaplan that which are part of effective coping. Effective coping should uh, include at least some of these characteristics and some of these you know characteristics are very insightful and can be used in our day to day functionings. Uh, now, we will talk about um, concept of coping effectiveness training. So, when we talk, uh, talk about coping effectiveness training obviously, you know uh, there are diverse ideas around it, but we will be specifically talking about a training module that was developed by Chesney and Falkman in 1996 and then they elaborated on it. So, we will not go into specific details of the training model because it is you know it depends on the situation and the and to whom the training is given. So, a lot of details depends on that, but we will try to understand the core characteristics of the training that was 
developed uh, you know, which is called a scoping effectiveness training uh, so that we understand how effective uh, you know, coping can be applied in our life. So, the framework this uh, coping effectiveness training framework uh, converts major ideas of stress and coping theories of psych psychological uh, literature from, uh, from various theories and ideas and concepts that have been discovered in the literature of psychology. From there they took uh, those conceptual ideas and try to use them in more practical state forward steps. How can we actually you know in a practical manner we can use them because there are so many ideas, but how to use them in our life. So, this coping effectiveness training deals with those practical aspects of using those uh, theoretical concepts. So, this framework uh, talks about three important steps for effective coping three important necessary steps for effective coping. The first is uh, no, specificity of stressor. So, in this step basically uh, we need to identify stressors and break them from general to more specific stressors. So, the first step is to kind assess the situation or the stressor which whatever the situation or the event that is causing you stress and then break those stressful circumstances or stressors or stimulus from general to more specific, from bigger to more specific stressors. As we have discussed, it, it was also one of the characteristics discussed by Kaplan. So, this, this is first important step, breaking general stressor into more specific stressors, so that you know what to do now. The second characteristic is to look at the changeability of stressors, find out what are the aspects of that situation which is stressful, which can be changed and what are the aspects which cannot be changed by you. So, changeable aspects and unchangeable aspects sorting them is the second important thing and third important uh, aspect of coping effectiveness training is matching strategies with those sources of stressors. So, if if there are aspects which are changeable, then you use certain kind of coping strategies, you know, such as problem focus coping. So, because it can be changed, so try to change the source of it. So, stress will automatically reduce. If there are some aspects in that stressor which is unchangeable, then it is better to use emotion focus coping because you cannot do anything actively in terms of solving the problem. Then the only thing that is left with you is to manage the distressing emotions that are generated by it. So, if I show it in a diagrammatic with a diagram, so Falkman and other used a diagram to uh, kind of show the steps of coping effectiveness training. So, first is uh, you know let us say you have a situation which is more general stressor. then you break it into more specific stressors. Then in that specific stressor, you find out what is changeable and what is unchangeable. And for changeable aspect, it is always more effective that effective coping strategy is problem focus coping. 
so use problem focused coping strategy For unchangeable aspects, it is more adaptive that you use emotion focused coping strategy. So, this is the approach of coping effectiveness training is that you know first you break general stressor into more specific stressors, then in the specific stressors find out what is changeable and what is unchangeable, use uh, problem focused coping for changeable aspects, use emotion focused strategy for unchangeable aspects. So, this is the approach which is more effective in terms of dealing with the stressful situation. So, let us see uh, each of these steps little bit more details. So, general versus specific stressors. So, as we have already uh, discussed effective coping starts with breaking a large global uh, stressful situation into more manageable specific stressors that needs attention in the present moment. So, breaking large global some bigger problem into more smaller chunks. So, this approach reduces our stress as we have to deal with one chunk of stressors at a time. It redu reduces stress because then you know exactly what to do now and what to deal with now rather than really thinking only about so many things that you do not have control over at the present moment. Focus on more specific and recent event that needs attention rather than on large global situation. Ask who, what, where and when to get to specific event or situation. For example, these are some of the examples how to kind of you know move from more you know general and global to more specific stressors. So, let us say somebody says I am highly stressed and anxious by the deteriorating health condition of my father. So, his parents health condition is kind of causing lot of stress. So, health condition of parents is a kind of more global and general you cannot really directly deal with health condition every aspect of it. So, you can kind of break it into more specifics. So, more specific could be uh, you know his deteriorating health condition one of the primary reason could be not taking medicine regularly which is worsening the health condition or it could be more specific that he forget to take medicine today morning. So, it could be you can take it more at in the present moment itself. So, now what we need to deal with. So, deteriorating health condition is a kind of more global you do not know what to do with it, but what you need to do now is to give him medication for today that so that is he is not skipping medicine for today's medicine. So, deal with giving today's medicine. So, one step one step at a time. So, it is it is much more easier and easy to deal and you know what to do. So, this is one example another example could be somebody is dealing with poor economic condition. So, poor economic condition is a very general global stressor you do not know actually what to do with it. So, let us say one of the aspects of poor economic condition is you had to borrow money to be your expenses. So, you have borrowed money from other people which is causing stress. Uh, then may be more specific at the present moment what you need to do about your economic crisis is that you need to arrange money to pay the rent of this week. In this week you have to pay the rent. So, now this is much more specific and more you know uh, uh, specific stressor now that you have to arrange the rent for rent of this month. So, then it is much more manageable than you know rather than thinking I do not I have economic crisis and lot of problems. So, because which is much more global 
and you don't know what to do. So, the expression of your economic crisis in the present moment is paying rent. So, you can focus on that and deal with this which is much more manageable and you know, doable. So, this is an example how you can break uh, general uh, situations into more specific situation that can be dealt with. The next is changeable and unchangeable situations. So, some situation can be changed while others cannot be, we all know. There are many situations in our life uh, which we can change by our efforts and hard work whatever is needed. What, but there are many situations where you cannot really do anything about it, about the situation in terms of changing it. For example, you know changeable stressor is let us say you want to quit smoking. It can be done because it is up to you, you know uh, you can take some step you know, to quit smoking, it can be done, it is changeable. An example of unchangeable stressor is let us say you know, specifically death related uh, you know stressors, the loss of loved one. No? You cannot do anything about death, you know somebody died now nothing can be done about it, it is unchangeable. Many situations are complex in which some aspects can be changed and some cannot be changed. So, there may be many situations where you know, uh, you know uh, where sometimes you know it is a very complex situation no, and there are something can be changed, something cannot be changed. So, there are many such situations that we face in our day to day life. And also there is a subjective aspect to stress in every uh, dimensions of it. Sometimes what one person sees as unchangeable, another person may consider as changeable. So, we do not know maybe you know, uh, you know quitting smoking seems to be unchangeable for one person. So, he may be so addicted to it that he cannot simply quit it. So, for uh, for his perception I mean it may look like an unchangeable thing, for other it can be very easy to do it. So, it all depends on uh, the subjective perceptions also many times. Sometimes objectively things cannot be done, sometimes subjective interpretation makes it very difficult also. The third thing uh, that we have discussed is you know, matching the coping strategies with the situation. That was the third important aspect of coping effectiveness training program. So, effective coping involves using different types of coping while dealing with changeable and unchangeable aspects. So, you have to find out in a situation what I can change, what I cannot change and it is you who need to find out. And we have already uh, discussed that you know for changeable situation it is always more adaptive and better that you use problem focus coping. So, whatever in the situation that is causing stress, you simply you know, change it, so that it is no longer disturbing you, change the problem. So, anything that is causing problem, you know. So, you know if you are in a job which is causing lot of problem, so one thing you can do, you can quit the job and you know, take another job. So, this could be an example of problem focus coping because you know it is changeable in the sense you can quit and find out another job. For unchangeable situation emotion focus coping, if something is very difficult to change and you cannot really do anything at the present moment, it is then better to use emotion focus coping, try to manage your distressing emotions. So, too much of anxiety stress is happening, use some strategies that can relieve it. So, you can use various relaxation you know exercises, you can use social support, talk to people, find out solutions and you know, seek emotional support from other etcetera. So, if something cannot be changed, it is better and more adaptive that you use emotion focus coping. And we have already discussed you know details of problem focus coping and emotion focus coping in the earlier lectures. Frustrations and maladjustment happens when people do not match appropriate coping to the situation. When we are not able to appropriately match the situation with the uh, coping strategy, then uh, you know it is going to have maladaptive coping strategy and it will not really solve the problem and will not be able to come out of the stress, simply because we are not matching the right strategy with the situation. So, if somebody you know where things can be changed, but he is not changing and running away and doing emotion focus coping. I mean it may temporarily you know serve the purpose, but in long term it will not help. 
So, lot of avoidance coping is about like that mismatching no, where things needs to be changed you can you need to change. Uh, so, that matching of appropriate strategies are very important. So, these are some of the broad ideas about effective coping some of the things that we can do. We have discussed some of the characteristics uh, which will help us to use effective coping and we have also specifically discussed in a more practical ways how can we you know, uh, deal with a stressful situation and use more effective strategies. So, now we will talk about more specific techniques or exercises that we can do for effective coping. So, these are these were the broad approach that we have talked about where it was not very specific for a specific things, but now we will talk about specific techniques and strategies uh, which can be used for effective coping. So, today we will talk about physical ways of coping at the physical level we can what can we do. So, in the physical ways of coping one thing that can be done is you no know, is, you know, physical exercise. It may look very counterintuitive that generally people associate physical exercise with physical health. Uh, generally, we do not associate physical exercise with stress and mental factors, uh, but interestingly it has a very strong connection. So, most of us are aware of the physical health benefits of exercises, we all know about it. However, research indicate that you know exercise also promotes mental health and reduces stress levels. It has also been found to be connection with reduction of stress and promoting mental well being also. Simply because you know mind and body are not separate thing you know they are continuously interacting with each other. So, generally whatever you know is beneficial for body actually it is also beneficial for your mind also. Now, physical exercises particularly aerobic exercises received lot of attention in the context of stress research and particularly aerobic exercises such as running, dancing and other aerobics. So, you know uh, you do skating, running uh, even can swimming could be also another example you know. These aerobic exercises you know are very beneficial in the context of stress reduction. Studies indicate that people report feeling calmer they become much more relaxed and calm after 20 to 30 minutes of aerobic exercises and which may last for several hours after exercises. So, lot of you know research actually indicates that uh, after doing aerobic exercises or some sort of exercises people generally report let us say after 20 30 minutes of exercise uh, people generally report you know more relaxation and more you know calmness in your in, in their mental experiences. So, they become much more calm and relaxed. So, you know in a very obvious way it reduces stress. So, what could be the possible uh, mechanisms by which you know physical exercise can reduce stress? Uh, some of the research that indicates that you know there could be some two possible ways. One is physical exercise you know brings about some physiological changes, some benef beneficial physiological changes. So, it does some changes in your body in terms of physiology, in terms of you know hormones and other uh, you know physiological activities and which ultimately reduces stress. And another uh, pathway is a pathway could be a time out from stressors. So, exercise gives you a break from your worries and tensions of your life. So, whenever you are doing exercise you are kind of getting break from all the all the worries and you know tensions that you are experiencing in your life. So, that also relieves you know and reduces stress. So, let us uh, you know discuss these two mechanisms. So, in the light of some research evidences. How exercise is connected to physiological changes? So, according to uh, one Harvard Medical School publication, the physiological impact of exercise include one thing is you know by exercise reduces stress hormones such as cortisol. So, we have already discussed uh, the physiological impact of stress in our body in the in, in, in you know in, in an elaborate ways in the 
past lectures. And we have seen cortisol is one of the stress hormone which is released when we experience stress, particularly when we experience chronic stress. And when we do exercise, you know, it reduces those stress hormones which are released in the body. So, because simply because when we feel calmer uh, or relaxed, stress hormones reduces from your blood, from your body and it ultimately further reduces your you know, uh, stressful experiences. Another important thing that was kind of uh, you know, research indicated is that you know release of endorphins is a kind of hormone that is released in our body and brain. And this particular uh, hormone acts like a pain painkiller and it enhances our mood. So, when endorphins are released in your body because of your before when we do exercises, particularly aerobic exercises, it enhances our mood, it helps to make you you know feel high after that is why many people report they feel high after exercises, particularly aerobic exercises, they feel good about themselves, they feel happy and their kind of mood enhances. So, this is primarily because of the release of this hormone called endorphins, uh, which one of the function is kind of it enhances mood. Uh, so, these are some of the aspects of physiological changes that is you know, uh, you know, brought about by exercise. Some other physiological benefits some research indicate that you know exercise induces increase in hypothalamic temperature, hypothalamus which is an organ in the brain which promotes tension reduction following exercise. So, it can also do some other physiological changes such as increase hypothalamic temperature uh, which seems to reduce you know tension and stress. Anxiety and stress reduces following exercise may be caused by a post exercise decrease in brain cortical activity. Some other research indicate that our cortical activity that is outer layer of the brain whenever we experience stress you know its activity becomes very chaotic and you know very disturbed. Uh, so, and becomes hyperactive. So, exercise reduces those cortical hyperactivity and as a result it helps you to calm down and relax and reduces all the negative impacts of stress. So, this could be some other additional you know physiological impact which are beneficial uh, in terms of stress reduction by doing exercises. The next uh, pathway that we have discussed is called as time out hypothesis. So, uh, basically this means exercise reduces stress and anxiety by giving a break from whatever is causing a individual problems or worries. So, generally whenever we are caught up in a problem uh, in a life situations continuously thinking about it and exaggerating it. Uh, many times doing some activities such as exercise can give you break from that. You know? Whenever you are doing a physical activities, you are kind of in the present moment doing that activity. So, at least you know it is giving you a temporary at least break from those uh, you know, worries and problems. So, that helps you to reduce stress at least in that moment. So, this is called as time out hypothesis uh, proposed by some researcher as shown in the slide. A study tried to test this time out hypothesis uh, by measuring state anxiety in four conditions. So, so some experiments were conducted to test out this hypo hypothesis whether this time out hypothesis is, uh, is really working in the context of exercise or not. So, they used four conditions where you know, participants were given you know, uh, task in the four conditions. One condition was you know simply resting. So, some people were simply rested in one condition. In another condition, uh, the participants were asked to read or study something. So, one condition rest, another condition to read something or study something. Third condition was the participant were asked to involve into exercise, particularly aerobic exercise only. And the fourth condition was uh, participant were asked to study as well as exercise at the same time. So, this can be done for example, you know in a treadmill one can 
run as well as read something. So, these four conditions participants were kind of divided into these four conditions and the impact of these four condition was then uh, recorded and tried to see what happens to the participants in all these four conditions. So, research indicate that you know uh, they reported that you know exercise only condition where the participants were only doing exercise aerobic exercise had the greatest coming effect. So, they kind of reported uh, in terms of you know uh, that uh, in terms of objective and subjective parameter uh, the greatest calming effect. So, they were felt uh, calm and relaxed much more than all the in other conditions. However, when participants were not given break from their stressors in the studying while exercise. So, in the fourth condition where the participants were studying as well as doing exercise. So, there was no break actually. So, they are doing exercise, but they are occupied their mind was occupied. So, that timeout hypothesis was not working there. So, in that condition exercise did not have the same benefit as it was there in the only exercise condition. So, this kinds of uh, you know, at least grip uh, give some evidence that you know evidence to time out hypothesis for exercise. So, it kind of gives you break and uh, from the normal day to day problems that you were caught up with and uh, helps you to reduce stress by giving break as well as you know making various positive physiological changes in the body. So, how much exercise is necessary? Uh, some of the researchers also kinds of try to address this question. Generally moderate to vigorous aerobic exercise program. Uh, which is about 150 minutes moderate and 75 minutes of vigorous per week uh, is sufficient to bring out necessary positive changes, which basically means somewhere around half an hour exercise per day uh, is good enough to bring positive changes or positive physiological effects in the body. However, for taking time out or break from stressors, a shorter duration can also be beneficial. Uh, which can serve purpose especially for people who are having lack of time or fatigue issues where they cannot really do exercise for a long time. For them even in a shorter duration of exercise could be beneficial especially in the context of giving them break from the normal problems of life. So, in terms of time out, but in general you know having even, even half an hour exercise which combines some moderate to some vigorous exercise aerobic exercise could bring out the sufficient and significant positive changes in your body in terms of stress reduction and promoting physical and mental well being. So, uh, these were some of the idea, uh, ideas you know as, as, uh, uh, about how physical exercise can actually you know reduce stress or can be used as an effective coping strategy. So, many times we do not think physical exercise in terms of coping strategy, but indirectly even though directly you may not thinking about coping with the stress, but getting involved into physical exercise can indirectly help you to cope with the uh, difficulties and stressful circumstances of life and uh, which can be done by everybody. So, this is one of the important aspects. So, in the next uh, or coming few lectures, we will be talking about many other specific coping strategies, which are very adaptive and can be used by us from you know at various levels of strategies we will discuss. So, we will be discussing more mind body strategies. So, today we have discussed purely physical kind of exercise. We will be discussing my strategies which are related to mind body uh, connection. Then we will be talking about pure mental strategies where you can you know, deal with the problems and stress at the mental level. Then we will be talking about some deeper level of coping such as social support and the and uh, you know meditation techniques and other things. So, coming few lectures will deal with only specific constructive coping strategies. So, with this I end today's lecture. Thank you.